Hello, everyone. Fabulous to see you all here today in our MSE. Um, welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 613th New Social Environment. I'm Eleanor, the program's associate here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Zoraida Lopez Diago, Lola Flash, Danielle Nolan, and Jessica Holmes. We're also thrilled to welcome our poet and amazing colleague Raven Sr. here to close today's program with a poetry reading. The Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter and that here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and the Shinnecock Indian Nation. We recognize land acknowledgements are not a replacement for the actual and necessary work of decolonization, but reminder of place and how the legacies of dispossession and enslavement that sustained and enriched the stolen land we are speaking from. And now to introduce today's amazing guests and host, photographer and curator Zoraida Lopez Diago is co-creator co of Women Picturing Revolution. Her photographs and installations have been exhibited at Rush Arts New York and the Paul Baldwell Gallery in Medellin, Colombia, among many other galleries. Most recently, Zoraida was the assistant curator um, to the Picturing Bl Black Girlhood exhibition, which focuses on the identities and important contributions of Black girls in the United States. Working at the forefront of gender queer visual politics for more than four decades, photographer Lola Flash's work challenges stereotypes and gender, sexual, racial preconceptions. An active member of ACT UP during the AIDS epidemic in New York, Flash was notably featured in the 1989 Kissing Doesn't Kill poster. Their art and activism are profoundly connected, fueling a lifelong commitment to visibility and preserving the legacy of LGBTQIA communities of color worldwide. Flash has work in important collections such as those at the MoMA, the Whitney, and the Museum of African American History and Culture, to name a few. And they are a proud member of the uh, Kamoinj Collective and on the board of Queer Art. A rising senior at DePaul University, Danielle Nolan studies, Dan or studies early childhood education and developmental therapy. She has been a youth leader at a long walk home since 2015 and has travel, traveled to New York, DC and other major cities to empower women and girls through her voice and art. In 2019, Danielle was selected as a Monument Lab Fellow and featured in New York Times as one of the youngest Black women activists spearheading change in Chicago. Her photographs have been featured in many exhibitions, including Picturing Black Girlhood at Columbia University in 2016 and at Express New Work in 2022. Danielle is now the program assistant for A Long Walk Home. And finally, our host, um, Jessica Holmes, as a writer, editor, and critic with writing featured regularly in Bomb, Hyperallergic, and the Brooklyn Rail, where she also edits the Artonic column. Previously, she served as editor-in-chief of the art publication Degree Critical, and for nearly two decades, she worked for the Calder Foundation, including six years as its deputy director. Um, we thank all of you so very much for joining us today. Um, so excited for this conversation, and I'm honored to pass the mic over to you, Jessica. Thank you, Eleanor, and thank you to everyone who is joining us today, and especially to our guests, Zoraida and Lola. And um, just before we get going, I wanted to let you all know that Danielle is um, digitally en route right now, and we are hoping that she'll be able to join us a little bit later on in the conversation. So stay tuned for that. Um, but in the meantime, I'm happy to be joining with Zoraida and Lola. And before we really get going into the exhibition, um, Eleanor gave a very lovely introduction, but I thought Zoraida and Lola, I'd give you um, a minute or two just to tell us uh, each about your respective practices to sort of ground our audience in uh, what it is we're about to look at and speak about together. 
Uh, thanks, Jessica, and thank you to Brooklyn Rail, and thanks to everyone for joining. It's so nice to see so many familiar faces and names, and I kind of see more people popping into the room. Um, again, my name is Zoraida Lopez-Diago, and I'm the co-curator of Picturing Black Girlhood Moments of Possibility. My um, photography practice and my practice as a curator and also as a writer um, of photography really focuses on um, women and girls. Um, I uh, frequently think about how the voices of women and girls, particularly girls of color and Black girls, it's often rele relegated to the side sidelines. And when um, we do see images of Black girls, they're often not produced by Black girls. Um, and so through my process um, uh, as a photographer, and as a curator, I think about how to make work in a way that is collaborative and really equitable and pushes those voices forward in a way that hopefully disrupts the canon of photography and uh, disrupts the hierarchy of our work. Thank you. And Lola, would you like to say a little something about your practice as well? Sure. Um, hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Um, and the same is right. It's really great to see so many familiar faces. You all know who you are. Um, <laughs> so for me, uh, since I was a little girl, I've had a camera. I had a little Minox camera to start off with. So I think, I feel like I've always sort of been observing the world, you know, um, and sort of framing it. Uh, you know, to be honest, when, uh, when I was asked to be a part of this show, uh, you know, I was like, hmm, I don't think so. Uh, you know, it felt like it was, uh, you know, this idea of what a girl was uh, before I heard what it was all about, you know, it just felt very sort of like um, binary. And I thought, you know, it doesn't include, I, the word girl for me right now doesn't include everybody. You know, for me, I was always uh, a girl who liked to wear boys' clothes. And so my identity was the way I kind of look now, right? Sort of, you know, I always dress in masculine clothes. My hairstyle is masculine, right? But obviously a lot of these terms have, have changed and sort of merged. And, uh, you know, um, Malcolm X, you know, he said, you know, back last century that we really need like a new vocabulary. We need new words to ex to explain uh, these different terms and uh, and folks. And so then when I, um, I think then they got Zoraida and to, to talk to me, she's like, girl, come on, you're gonna get a be in it. And, and, and she talked about the expansive idea about, around what girls were. And so that, you know, really, you know, you didn't have to really co convince me very much. Once, once I was like, you know, understanding that, it was girl in all of its it, its sort of like understandings and you know visual ideas around it. So so then I was happily um, wanting to, to be a part of it. And uh, once we get to you know show my picture that that's included, you know again I will be able to explain a little bit more about uh, this idea of of gender and of sometimes feeling very alienated because the words don't describe who you feel like you are. So I'll just end on that and then carry on with some other points. Great. So thank you. Thank you, Lola. And you've actually brought up a, a couple of really interesting points already because, um, you know, in preparing for this today, I've been doing some reading and Zoraida, I believe the genesis for this show goes back really years and years to around 2009 or 10, is that right? Yeah, um, so for the first iteration of the show, it was at Columbia University as part of their Black Girl Movement Conference in 2016. And I was served as assistant curator for that show. Um, um, Shahrazad, uh, co-curator and also founder of A Long Walk Home, uh, an organization for girls in Chicago, spoke about going to a show um, that focused on girlhood and there was only one image of a black girl and it was not made by a black woman. And so to be in a space that's supposed to talk about girlhood, 
um, and to not see anyone who looks like you. And when you do see someone who looks like you, the image wasn't made by someone who looks like you. Um, it's quite piercing for an adult or for a black girl. And that kind of got the juices going to think about producing a show by black girls and for black girls with black women and kind of how to have um, black women and girl photographers in conversation. And so the first iteration of the show in uh, 2016 was really thinking about space and black girls like taking over space. And the opening of that show was really amazing. We had an ice cream truck. We had girls doing double dutch. Uh, we had a Black girl DJ from DC. I mean, if you weren't a Black girl in that space, you were just kind of pushed to the side. It was for Black girls. And it was so amazing to see. And Shahrazad and I had always thought about, you know, if we got to do the show again, who would we want to be in it? And we would send texts and, you know, share like folders and tag each other on Instagram. And for the second iteration, everyone we asked said yes. Um, and so the show just kept on growing and growing. And now um, we have artists ranging from age eight to 94 with um, 180 pieces um, and uh, roughly 80 artists. Mm -hmm. It really is incredible. Um, you know, Eleanor, maybe we can um, put up the slideshow so the audience can see some of the installation shots as we speak. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that Lola brought up is that, you know, in that time, you know, since since the first iteration of the show, um, what we even think about when we think of the word girl has really changed quite a bit. Is that something you and Shahrazad were thinking about as you developed this iteration of the show, which is huge and impressive? <laughs> Absolutely. You know, we were thinking about gender expansive youth, and we wanted to make sure that um, gender expansive youth were in this show and really represented with their own voice. So um, we have some work, <clears throat> excuse me, by Samantha Box that she made of um, Sylvia's Place, the first uh, homeless shelter for, and the only at that time, for LGBTQ plus youth in New York City. Um, we have work by um, a young woman, Jada Rodriguez, and actually her work is in conversation with Lola Flash um, on what we call our icon wall in the main section um, of the gallery. And there are numerous other examples of um, girls and I'm non-binary youth in the show. So we, we definitely wanted to include that. So much has happened since 2016. So um, we also have a wall dedicated to um, protests. And what does that look like? Because often black girls are leading the way. Um, you know, when we think about George Floyd, it was a young black girl who actually took the video of the horrible atrocity that happened and the coronavirus and the impact that that has had um, on Black girls. So we wanted to make sure all of those things were part of this show. Um, we have one room that's um, called our Black Utopia Room. And we wanted to make sure that there was also a space for Black girls to rest mm -hmm. because um, we don't talk about or think about the care and the tenderness that Black girls need and deserve. Um, so we have this beautiful room with a photograph by Nadia Blas on the wall. Um, and these two incredibly um, intricate woven um, lounge chairs made by um, the artist Kim Hill in the space. Right. Uh, let's let's stay there for a little bit and talk about the um, the thematics of the show because it is sort of grouped thematically. Um, for the audience members who haven't had an opportunity to see the exhibition yet, it's three floors, um, quite large in a cavernous space. So um, I imagine that the organization um, took some time and effort, Zoraida. Can you talk about that process and, and how you came to um, land on the, the themes that you do land upon? Um, it absolutely did. You know, Shahrazad and I were at Express Newark 
spending many hours with just kind of moving things around the entire space. But I will say, you know, um, this this exhibition was a team effort. Uh, Sally Misha Tillett, the executive director of Express Newark, um, was so um, inspirational and really pushed Shahrazad and I to dream big and take over the entire space. And you know, this could not happen with her uh, vision and her support and. Um, Aliyah Allen, our assistant curator, was just, we call her, um, we call her the genius because she's kind of the, the genius behind making all of these things happen. So um, when we received all this work, we knew we wanted to focus on a few different themes. One, um, a theme of the first floor is collaboration, and it really looks at how Black women and Black girls view each other as collaborators when they make this work not viewing um, not viewing um, one another as subjects or you know photographer as subjects. Um, Nydia Bloss specifically talks about uh, viewing the young um, people that she works with as collaborators and how it's a it's a very distinct process um, that is much more equitable. Um, so we have some of her work on the first floor, images also by Nona Fosteen that she's taken of her daughter Queen. Um, over the years, um, images by uh, Janine Murasami Ash, um, where she spent on the Gullah Islands photographing um, families and, and girls there. Um, we also have uh, images by Creative Soul. We have an amazing, um, you know, roughly 60 foot image, floor to ceiling of. Um, that creative soul made. And then when we go up the staircase into the second floor, we the images there are of um, a higher plane. They look more at nature. Um, we have uh, images by Deborah Jack, and she talks about the ocean and history of land um, in that section. And it's a it's a very uh, multimedia show. We have a glass case with dresses and garments um, reflecting Black girlhood. Um, we have a prom suit from a genderqueer young person. We have a King Sionetta dress. We have a dress by um, the oldest artist in the show that she made. She's 94. Um, she made for her eighth grade home ec graduation. So it's her home ec dress. And that's next to a video um, that her daughter, Adrienne Wheeler made about that work. And then here, these are images by Shahrazad Tillett. This is our icon um, um, section. It's, it's in the main gallery. Um, so here are some images that she made during COVID next to images um, of a young girl um, in Jamaica and next to another Nydia Blas piece. Um, so we really wanted to kind of have young girls images right next to images by uh, more established photographers to kind of even break up the hierarchy of how we think of work that young people make and work that adults make. And then when we move to the top floor, the theme is beauty. Um, and on that floor, um, we have this really powerful video by uh, a woman, Kiri Davis. I don't know if some of you may remember this video she made where she um, redid the, um, like the black doll test where you take a, a black doll and you have black children um, tell you, you know, do they think the doll is good or the doll was bad? And that, that was done, I think about like 60 years ago and she re redid that in um, I think 2003 and the results were pretty much the same. And that video was actually like the first example of something breaking the internet, you know? And that was the first example of a video going viral and the internet didn't know what to do and it kind of crashed a lot of sites. Right. Uh, Eleanor, if you could go back just one image, um, this is a sort of, this is an installation shot of one of these themes within the broader floor, the, the protest section, and um, Zoraida, one of the things that really did strike me about this particular um, 
you know, spot in the exhibition was your, you know, deft curation of taking these images from, I think, the, like, the late 50s, early 60s, and pairing them with um, images from the Black Lives Matter protests from two years ago. Uh, can you talk about that conversation between the older and the newer works a little bit? Yeah, you know, one thing that I think um, was um, so special about this show and some of the images is this is also the last show that Doris Derby, the photographer Doris Derby was in and she photographed protests during the civil rights era in a very kind of nuanced way. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to show um, on this wall that um, there are different ways of protest and there are different kind of ways of documenting protests Mm -hmm. um, by having uh, this wall primarily in black and white, I feel like it very much like collapses time. Um, and we're able to kind of see how black girls have been documenting um, and are on the front lines of protest, you know, since the 1960s. So in the center, we have um, a, a piece by Deborah Roberts, um, and then on either on, you know, to the right, you can see an image by Doris Derby. And on the left, we have two pieces um, made by young women from A Long Walk Home. Sheila P. Bright's also on this wall, um, a young um, woman, Fanta Dia from Bronx Dock. Mm -hmm. And you kind of, um, what I think is so beautiful is, you know, you don't really know who's making what work. It's just mm -hmm. so, it's just, um, Kind of uh, very, very fluid in a way that um, it took Shahrazad and I kind of a while to get to that point. But this was one wall that we, you know, we felt very um, proud of. And I think, uh, I think Danielle actually, I think she, she just joined. Um, oh, great. Too. Oh, good. We'll, um, we'll introduce her and get her involved uh, when she's settled on um, just Eleanor, you can give me a thumbs up there. But um, speaking of Doris Derby, um, maybe Eleanor, if you could flip to slides uh, 16 for just a moment so we could um, just dwell on her work there for a minute. She was a photographer who was new to me and she's got several works in the show. Um, and I was very, um, you know, struck by the, you know, her, I mean, she documents in, in such a, in a photojournalistic way that recalled for me, like Gordon Parks or, um, you know, the photographers of that era. And yet I feel like she's somebody that has flown under the radar. Um, can you talk about some of those artists that you were able to include um, from an earlier generation who maybe have not got the recognition that they probably deserve? Yeah, you know, it was, um, we felt so good and so proud to include Doris Derby in this show because she is incredibly um, influential and, like you said, just kind of flies under, um, flies under the radar for so many people. But her work is really, uh, really, really powerful and um and strong. So we were so glad to have her in the show. Um, we wanted to make sure that the show was international, but also felt local. So we have folks like um, Adrian Wheeler, whose family has been um, in Newark for um, hundreds of years. And then also Ayanna Jackson, whose family is from East Orange and one of the kind of earliest free families in New Jersey history um, also in the show. So they're kind of these moments where even um, there may be an artist who um, we may know about, but aspects of their history or their lives um, are being kind of revealed for the first time in the show too. Right. Um, Eleanor, if maybe you could flip to slides 14 and then follow it with 15, uh, we can look at, um, Elizabeth Wheeler's work. And here is the dress um, section that Zoraida mentioned earlier, um, really beautiful moment in the show and one of the more sculptural moments. Um, so uh, I believe the dress that um, 
you're speaking about is the one all the way to the left. Is that right? Yeah, it is. Um, so that dress was made, I, I think it was in 19, it was made in the 1940s, uh, mid 1940s for her eighth grade graduation as part of her home at class. And, um, you know, when we were getting the dress forms for this part of the show, it was very <laughs> hard to get a dress form. Um, for such for such a small a small body um, but we you know we wanted to make sure that um, that we were thinking about girlhood in a very um, expansive way across across time um, and we we wanted to have a, a real multiple multi-generational show mm -hmm. um, and we want to show how Black girlhood from the 1940s could be and is in conversation with Black girlhood now. And Eleanor, just flip forward one so we can see the, there is the dress um, in a family photograph, correct? Which yeah. is um, nicely blown up directly across from, from the dress itself. Um, I found that like a particularly touching moment. And also one of the moments, you know, a lot of the themes are, of course, very heavy and dealing with serious issues. But one of the things that I really enjoyed about walking through this exhibition was also these moments of just happiness and joy. Um, is that something that was organic to planning the show or were you thinking about it consciously? Absolutely. You know, um, it was really important to remember that Black girlhood is multidimensional and that Black girls need and deserve happiness and joy and to be girls and to be kids. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that I think is... Um, is incredibly unfortunate, the adultification of Black girls in particular. So we wanted to make sure that we had the um, tenderness and the care around Black girls. You know, Nydia Blas kind of talks about this in how she displays um, her images. And so for very sensitive images, she has that image surrounded by images that she calls kind of like protective images. And we have one of those images um, in our show and we specifically placed that image to the back of um, the Paul Robeson Gallery, the main gallery. So it's in the in the back and it's kind of sectioned off um, by, by two walls. So it's protected in a way and we wanted to make sure mm -hmm. that um, images that were a little bit more sensitive were cared for because that's kind of the general theme we want the viewer to leave with um, around Black girls. Should we flip to that image quickly so the audience can see? I believe it's number 13. Is that right? I don't know. No. Oh, um, we're talking, okay, this is the yeah. you know, room, but maybe yeah. it's a good moment to bring that in as well. Yeah. So the Utopia Room has been this really, um, really kind of surprising space that has taken on a bit of a life of its own. Shahrazad and I imagined, you know, um, folks being inside of the main gallery, seeing protests, um, seeing we have these, these coffins um, by Ebony Patterson. Mm -hmm. And then after that, um, going into kind of this freedom space and it's a full um, floor to ceiling, full walled uh, um, vinyl uh, print of Nydia Blas's piece from the Girls Who Spun Gold with the two chairs made by the artist Kim Hill. And people really love that space. They take the chairs, they move it around. You see young people just, you know, hanging out. Um, my- uh, Here, as Zoraida talks, Eleanor, one back. Sorry, Zoraida. It's okay. Yeah. Um, um, you know, my best friend's daughter was in the space. She keeps her sunglasses on and she's, you know, she's <laughs> four and she sits in the chair. Um, so it's, 
a space that um, we just, we love seeing how people interact with it. Yeah. You were telling me about the chairs a little bit the other day. Um, do you want to say a bit more about them? Because they are one of the few, I mean, obviously the show is dedicated to photography, but um, they are one of the, the sculptural elements and usable pieces as well. Yeah, so the artist who makes them, Kim Hill, um, she um, talks about the process of um, how she spent time with folks on the Gullah Geechee Islands and really used learning the process of weaving as a bit of a, a healing process. Mm -hmm. And um, Shahrazad actually, you know, found her and um, and spoke with her and we were able to rush and get the chairs into the space. And it was just, I mean, it is just such perfection to have mm -hmm those chairs in in that space um, and to see how people how people use them. Um, I'd love to um, draw in Lola a little bit so maybe we can go to her slide and the slides surrounding her work and um, talk a bit about portraiture which is such an integral part of this show. Uh, Lola, maybe you'd like to say something about Tenzin and then we can talk about the space where it's um, and the other works that are are surrounding it and the the intention behind that moment in the show. Yeah, sure, Jessica. Um, well, I wanted to to quote Bell Hooks for a second. Um, she said, uh, "One of the most vital ways we sustain ourselves is by building communities of resistance, places where we know we are not alone." Um, and I kind of feel like that this is what this show does. Um, and thinking about what Zoraida said earlier is about how a lot of lot of photographers in, in the particular, in this show, uh, you know, we think more about our models uh, or the, this is the process of, of photography as more of a collaboration rather than, you know, back in the day, it was like, this was a subject, right? And so, when you go through history and look at historical photographs, especially of folks who look like us, um, their names aren't even included, right? Mm -hmm. It's like man standing by, I don't know, bar or something like that. And so, you know, this kind of just dehumanizing of, of folks has been something that's been, a, a you know, the way forward for some folks, but not for us. And so I really do, I've always felt like my, if, you know, like without my models, I'm nothing, you know, that there's there's a really important uh, essence that, that each of my models bring. To bring. Um, and for the most part, they all end up being my friends in some way or another um, mm. in all of my series. Um, and so, uh, so, so well, Tenzin, speaking about Tenzin in particular, uh, so first of all, Tenzin just graduated from high school and is on, on, yeah. his, on his way to Harvard. Um, so I'm so excited for him and, um, you know, he was lucky. He was one of the lucky ones and many of us are, um, you know, where our, our families let us, uh, play around with gender. Um, here he's pictured with his sister's dress. Mm -hmm. Um, and on his way to the photo shoot, he asked his mom if he could pick up this, the, uh, the, fe the, the, uh, fan. Uh, so he was kind of totally styled by Tenzin. I think he was like, <laughs> three or four at this this age. Um, and so I, to be honest with you, I, I haven't photographed a lot of kids. Um, and so when I thought about what kind of picture I would I would uh, present, I was like, well, it's gotta be Tenzin, you know? And I, and I, I felt also, I, I, as I said earlier, I, I was feeling a little bit uneasy about <clears throat> being part of this show um, initially because I didn't realize the expanse of the idea um, around girl, girlhood. Um, and here Tenzin was really into wearing his sister's dress, you know, um, and, uh, you know, he kind of grew out of it. <clears throat> but I think that it's, it's so important for, for families, for parents to, to let kids play around with, with gender. Um, mm -hmm. I think, I mean, I think just the way that things are evolving, the world is evolving, um, we have mothers like Zoraida, for instance, uh, you know, who, well, it's common knowledge, right? You have two beautiful young boys. And mm -hmm. I just think that 
those boys as, as well as some of my friends' kids are going to have a lot of different kinds of um, elements within their, their character, right? Mm -hmm. So we're gonna have more boys that are, are more, um, more sensitive, so to speak, mm -hmm. or, you know, have, and, uh, you know, girls who, who are more like pushy. And, you know, so all these kind of like things that are, have been assigned to certain genders are nonsense and are made by mm -hmm. parents who decide to stick to those norms, right? And so um, I was really happy for Tenzin to be in in that sense, because I feel like it really sort of like talks about the ways that we grow up and how how such a at such a young age kids know. I mean, I knew when I was that age um, that I wanted to wear boys clothes, that I was like, mom, no more dresses. And in fact, my dad used to, so I'm from Jersey also, I'm from Montclair, New Jersey. Um, and uh, I spent a lot of time in my, when I was in high school going to Newark to um, to shop. And I, I guess where the, did it used to be like Bambergers or where the Express is or it used to be, was it a big department store where, where the Express is now, Zoraida? Yeah, um, yeah, so Express um, Newark is in the Haynes department store building. Haynes. And it's actually where uh, Roy DeCarava had his first, um, his first, studio, um, I'm sorry, where James Vanderzee had his first studio job is, is the studio. And at that point, Black people weren't allowed into the department store. And so to even see Black girls and Black women and Black gender queer youth take over that space in such a prominent way, um, I think is a powerful statement. Yeah, it's revolutionary. So yeah, it was, I remember it was Haynes, so I used to go down there. Um, and my dad used to take me to, there was like a, um, an army Navy, like around the corner. And my dad used to take me there and like, we would go straight to the boys department. You know, I didn't have to fuff around in the girls department. I went straight in there and got my jeans and my check shirts and I was happy, you know? And so, you know, it wasn't just a phase for me, obviously, uh, but it could have been, but you know, my parents went along with it. And so, uh, yeah, I think that uh, I'm excited for the future. I feel that a lot of these young folks uh, just really look at gender, they look at identity in a totally different way. They don't feel the need to, to say, you know, I'm lesbian or I'm gay. They're, you know, just very, uh, I think gender fluid is a word that's being used. And I, that's what I actually use um, in this series. Um, but again, there's still, we're still lacking in so many like proper words. Um, but this series pretty much came out of, um, it's called Surmise, this, this picture is from Surmise, and um, it really came from me being misgendered, uh, you know, uh, and I realized like a lot of my friends are sort of like me, they're not sort of um, prescribing to any norms. And, uh, you know, like when I go into the bathroom, the ladies holler at me and they're like, this is the ladies room. And I'm like, I'm a lady. Um, <laughs> And then also for like my straight friends, you know, I have a lot of straight friends who look gay and when they're with their gay friends, people think they're gay. So just this kind of like phenomena of the way that people react to how we look and then how they then decide to put, put us in a box. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I always like to say that unless you want to date that person or take them out, I don't really see why any of this kind of nonsense has to do what that this kind of nonsense has to do with anyone you know what I mean why do we have to why do we have to put people in a box why can't we just see a loving person mm -hmm. um yeah and I just wanted to say one more thing is that um one of my favorite photographs when I was like okay I'm at the right place was um Shahrazadzi I know it's gonna mess it up Shahrazad uh Tillet's uh photograph of Black girls, it's called Black Girls, a uh, good Good Friday morning, West Side, Chicago, Illinois. And it was based on a, an old photograph by Russell Lee, where he had taken pictures of a boy sitting on a, on a car. And it was called Negro Boys on Easter morning. And so what, what she's done here is she has just all kind of, you know, cute young ladies. They look like they might be 13 or 12. Uh, and the one in the middle has my favorite one has a tie, a bow tie on, and a and a um you know a, a jacket suit, a suit jacket. Um, and so I was just like, yeah, right, because we're all this is in the same like a way that I say 
this is the kind of girl, or now I say this is the kind of woman that I am, right? Um, and so I was just like, I loved that picture. Uh, and I, and also like what Zariah was also saying is that, uh, you know, I wasn't the only queer person in the show. Uh, a lot of times, you know, back in the day when the, you know, when black artists were in shows, you know, you'd have like one black artist, right? And it's show of all white folks. And so now I'm finding even in, in shows that are black, that there's like one queer person, like usually it's Zanelli Mahali, who I love. Um, but you know, Zanelli's story is, is not is not the queer story in America. Uh, and so I, I'm not saying anything. I mean, I'm like thankful to Zanelli that there's actually pictures of lesbians out there in the world, because if it weren't for her, you know, you would not see black, black lesbians out there. Um, and so uh this show is different. There's all kinds of different kinds of queer folk uh, that were included. Um, so that to me, that's just like another bonus um, in so far as like making sure that we're all included and we all feel seen and, and our stories, which have been so sort of secretive or shushed are, are out there, you know? So it's, um, I'm super happy I'm part of the show. <laughs> I, I will say Lola, I'm, I mean, I, I know Lola, she's a dear friend. And I'm so, so happy that she's in the show. And that image um, that Shahrazad made, I just put a link to it in the chat. And, you know, the original image was made by a WPA photographer and he went out and found these young black boys on a car on a Sunday morning. And, you know, I, I looked at that image and when I look at Shahrazad's image, there's um, a different level of like confidence that those girls have. And you can tell that the girls know the person who's taking the image. There's kind of like a different type of trust that you can see in that image. And the girl who um, is in the, mid in the middle with um, the, the bow tie, we have her prom suit, it's in the cape too. Um, so it's just kind of nice to, see how the relationships have developed because that show that image um, was in the first show and then um, it was in the second show and now the prom suit is in the case also in our second show. You know I just wanted to um, expand a little bit upon what Lola was saying about um, the feat of this show not be not putting um, people into boxes and I think another feat of non-hierarchical curating that was really achieved here is the is treating childhood and children in a way that is um, consequential and not sentimental and there are um, you know, many images, uh, I'd say a third to a half that were made by um, people who are under 18. Um, and maybe we can move to uh, Danielle's images, 27, 26, 27. I, it, has she joined us? I think I saw. Um, hi, Danielle. Hi, I'm great. I'm happy to be here. Oh, welcome. We're happy that you were able to attend. Welcome, welcome. Um, I would love to hear you talk about your images, but maybe first you could just, um, you know, introduce yourself to the guests and, and tell us a little bit about your practice. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Danielle Nolan. Um, I'm a part of Alone Walk Home's Girlfriends program. So Alone Walk Home is a nonprofit organization and where we use art to end violence against girls and women. Um, it was created by Shahrazad Tillett, who we just spoke about, the photographer. Um, and so A Long Walk Home is broken up into two different sections. The first program that came out of A Long Walk Home was um, called SOARS, which is an acronym that stands for Story of a Rape Survivor. It's a multimedia performance, and it includes photos that Shahrazad took of her sister during her healing process after being assaulted on multiple occasions. And the second part is the Girlfriends program, which I come in. Um, it started at my high school on the west side of Chicago. And I've been a part of that since my eighth grade year. And that was in 2015. I'm now a senior in college and I'm the program assistant. So I really love it there. Um, and in my second or third year girlfriends, 
I took this photo inspired by Carrie Mae Weems, Black Man Holding a Watermelon. In the program, we have like a, a curriculum and the first part of the curriculum is Girl Me. And that's just where you're realizing and you're thinking about all the things that like make you a girl and the things that um, like come with being a girl. And so this was um, for the girl me part of girlfriends. And we were asked to recreate a photo from different photographers that um, Shahrazad, AKA Miss Tilla has shown us. And the black man holding the watermelon picture really stood out to me because I'm all about storytelling and being in control of your own narrative. And that picture to me was trying to reclaim the stereotype about like black people like a watermelon. So I was like, oh, that should be very interesting. And then um, another part about this photo that I like is that it's a woman holding a watermelon too, a black woman. And I think that aspect is important too, because we all know how often women are left out of these stories and these narratives. And yeah, I just wanted to be in control of my own narrative while mm -hmm. also showing some love to Black women photographers that came before me, like Carrie Mae Weems. Mm -hmm. And in your next image, you also feature too, I think with your sister, is that right? Yes, so that's my older sister on the right and my younger sister on the left. My younger sister is now a girlfriend too, which is very nice. This is her first year of the program. But um, this picture was, um, was taken in 2021 and we were asked to recreate or give some response art from the documentary that we watched on Netflix called A Love Song for Latasha, which is also played um, at Rutgers. But um, this was a recreation of one of the scenes from the documentary. It was a very like beautifully recorded documentary. The cinematography was fantastic. And this one scene really stuck out to me. I wish I had like a screenshot of the picture, but I asked my sisters to be my muse because I don't know, I'm all about sisterhood and I'm all about, like I said, telling you, telling the stories of myself and other black girls. And I just wanted to show just a moment with my sisters just being together. The photo was also taken in my grandmother's living room, which is where whenever my family get together, like we're always in the front room, always just talking to each other, playing games, watching TV. And you can see like the photos in the back. Uh, my grandma, her house basically looks like a museum, like every other black grandma's house. So uh, I wanted to include that in the pictures as well. And then that's in the picture, I know you can barely see it in the background, but my mom, like her childhood photos in the back. So I thought that was important to add with my photos. Yeah, I think that's a really nice moment too. You have these portraits within the portrait that you're also making of a new generation of your family. Yeah. Um, I, I wanted to to just touch a little bit on portrait again. I think I had mentioned earlier, um, you know, it's such an important part of the show. Um, and just and just talk to each of you a little bit about um, what taking pictures of yourself or your family members or highlighting, you know, a person, um, you know, means or signifies for you. Um, I think we all know how media can switch up and twist up a story really fast and how they can portray you as being something that you're not. I think the importance of taking photos of myself and other people is that I'm able to tell their story the way that it's supposed to be told and it's not being switched or changed to what people want it to be. Um, so yeah, just being able to tell stories and I don't know, just help people speak without them having to actually speak mm -hmm. with my photos. And Lola, similarly, a lot of your work for, focuses on portraiture. Um, what what is it that is significant in to you when you're photographing an individual or yourself? Well, you know, for me, I, I spent forty years of creating portraits of my community, and I, probably communities would probably be more uh, more important, more uh, more clear to say. Um, and it's kind of interesting. So I was doing a, uh, a talk, a Zoom talk with Renee Musai on 
she was saying that a lot of what I've been covering the last 40 years, especially in the beginning, didn't um, didn't really have words for it. You know, like the intersectionality, that word wasn't around when I was a young photographer, um, for instance. And so um, I think I would go along with, you know, really a lot of what Dan Danielle said. I'm looking forward to seeing more of your work. Um, very, very impressive uh, what you had to say um, of just like being able to tell a story from our point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm always kind of like, you know, as, as we can see, well, basically I feel like since Mr. Floyd was killed, uh, you know, we do see some progress happening in the art world. I would say that I'm a prime example that, you know, a lot of museums are realizing the, the um, exclusion or the sort of like uh, missing parts to their collections. And they're, uh, you know, they're inviting me in, which feels really wonderful, you know, I'm happy to finally get my work into those museums. But for me, uh, you know, it was really about making images of my, my communities. Like I felt, I feel like a lot of the work I did, like the picture of, of Tenzin is uh, with a four by five camera. So mm -hmm. I feel like, I, you know, here I come dragging my big old camera into these people's spaces. And, you know, and they know that really my work is about beauty. So they know that Lola Flash thinks that they're beautiful. And for, you know, the hour and a half that it takes us to do our photo shoot, um, they feel beautiful. Mm -hmm. And anyone who's black knows that you can feel all beautiful and cute when you're inside. But as soon as you get out there, it doesn't matter if you're a kindergartner or if you have, uh, you know, a doctorate from, Yale or Harvard, you know what I mean? People don't see that. The cabs still don't pick us up, right? Um, and so just to give people that pause to be like, okay, Lola Flash thinks I'm beautiful. That was really like my whole like incentive to, to create the bodies of work that I had, I have. And so now that the work is getting into museums, uh, just got a few more, one, the Eastman Kodak, uh, George Eastman Museum, I uh, just collected some more of my work and, um, the Leslie Lohman Museum here in New York, um, two more museums added to my little list, which is growing. Um, but now I realize, okay, it actually is important. I was kind of anti-museums for a very long time, again, because we, I just didn't see ourselves. It was just like white walls and white people, and I just didn't feel comfortable. But now, like Brooklyn Museum is doing a great job, you know, of, of having more uh, artists of color. Um, and so now I realize, like, oh, okay, now that my work is out there, more people get to see it, right? Maybe that just seems kind of silly, but there was really no kind of internal uh, force in me to like be famous or to be rich. I've always taught to pay my bills um, so that I didn't really need to get the work bought. Mm -hmm. but now, it, it, especially now during the time when people, you know, I'm an artist, so I feel like I'm, I'm just very kind of like, I'm always thinking very positively and I, I feel that people are changing their minds and are at least thinking and having conversations that are, are engaging and are sometimes hard, but people are, people know they have to do the work, right? And so I think that those conversations are slowly happening. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, um, you know, my I do do some landscapes and things like that, but those are more, those feel more like watercolors to me in a way. Um, and so the portraits are really, I suppose, Oh, the other part, I know, sorry, I got off track a little bit. The other part is just like, I think that maybe Zoraida said something about it. It's like, we need to see more positive images of our people, right? Mm -hmm. We need to see queer folks looking proud. You know, I usually say something like, you know, think about power, think about someone that, that you admire. Um, you know, same with black folks, you know, we don't need to see people uh, you know, or, or even older people, right? A lot of my older portraits are, are, you know, these women who just look really strong and powerful because they are. And so it's really just like going against this tide or this sort of visual library that we've grown up with um, that says that we are less than. So in my photographs, I'm like, y'all look out, here we come. That's wonderful. And speaking of joy, it's always happy for me to end on a joyful note so maybe we can flip ahead to 
the Black Girl Takeover that happened in the space um, a couple of weeks ago. Zoraida, um, maybe you can talk a little bit about that. This isn't the first of these that has happened, but maybe it was the biggest. Well, the so this is the first iteration of the show was part of a, a, a conference um, at Columbia um, on Black girlhood. But this Black Girl Takeover, it was a one-day festival um, for Black girls with all different kinds of workshops mm -hmm. for um, Black girls. So there were a lot of girls from A Long Walk Home came, a Long Walk Home came girls um, from New York and New Jersey. And we had photography workshops. We had um, an owner of a day spa come and give massages. We had braiding workshops. We had a Vogue workshop, a TikTok workshop. Um, Tawny Chapman, um, her work is in the main gallery. Amazing photographer who worked with Gold Leaf. She led a workshop. Um, we had a like a, a head wrap workshop. Kim Hill led a workshop in um, on weaving um, in the Utopia Room. So it was just such a full day. Um, there's there's Tawny uh, Chapman right there. It was just like an amazing day to see Black girls just like making art and having fun and just really um, experiencing joy. And something Danielle said, because we had a, a panel, Danielle, um, that you know, black girls need to be um, thought of, and 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 um, we need tenderness. And I've just been thinking about that word, like tender. Like, what does it mean to treat someone tenderly? What does it mean to um, just be kind of very, very tender? And how do you how do you hold someone tenderly? And so I've been thinking about that, Danielle. I've been thinking about that word so much since that you know since that panel and how how can I and how can society just really hold black girls just just very um just with a lot of care with the care that they deserve and the care that they need well so right jump, I'm sorry can I just jump in real quick I think also this idea that uh you know we should be able to enjoy our our childhood you know I think for for black folks like as soon as again as soon as you step outside it's like you have to sort of have these these guards that go up, you know, you can't just be like, like that, like kids. Yeah, you can't, you know, and that's why, like, I think a lot of like uh, black parents sort of like get a, a rough deal because a lot of them are very uh, protective and, you know, uh, and that, and that's why, because they know what, what we have against going against us. So I think creating a space like this, you know, just makes like this safe space for girls to just be girls, you know, and not have to be objectified and all the rest. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, um, um, another thing too, is we made sure the photographer, Layla Stevens for the day, young black woman queer photographer. And I think it's kind of like that first floor when you think of collaboration, the fact that we had like a young black woman take photographs of, of this black girl takeover day just made the images so much more, you could, you know, you could feel kind of the emotion in some of the images of like one girl braiding another girl's hair. Like she, like she knew to kind of document those things because she, you know, she was a black girl herself. Mm -hmm. Well, Zoraida, I think your exhibition um, really goes a long way to reclaiming a lot of that joy and tenderness, as you said, for Black girls. And um, I thank you and I thank Lola and Danielle for joining today. And um, if you haven't, to the rest of the audience there, if you haven't been to see the exhibition yet, it's up for a few more weeks. And I really encourage you to get out to Newark to go see it. It really is um, a groundbreaking show in so many ways. Um, so thank you for this. Thanks, Jessica. Yes, thank you so, 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 so very much, Zoraida, Lola, Danielle, and of course, Jess. Um, it's been such an amazing, amazing conversation. Gonna have a lot, gonna have a lot to think about. Um, I am really excited to move into our 
audience Q&A now. Um, we've got a few questions um, here from the audience. Um, so our first question is going to be from uh, Pam, um, Pamison. Um, the question is, is there a catalog for this show or are there plans for there to be one? We, you know, we're, we have our, our mind uh, brewing on, on all different types of ideas. So we're hoping to have some form of um, publication in the near future. And we are also, um, you know, we, we want the show to live on. We want to find um, a home, a gallery, a museum to host the next iteration of Picturing Black Girlhood too. Great, um, thank you. And our next question is from Colette. Um, Colette, you should be able to unmute and ask your question. Thank you so much. Um, gosh, I, I hope I don't ramble on because I have so much to say. But um, having worked in the newspaper business, I often found that that was very true that, you know, sometimes my images were kind of like misunderstood. Um, for, an ex for example, I worked for a Jersey paper for about three years. Um, it was a really huge job. It's, it's not a job to play with because there's so much entailed with it. But anyway, I, uh, oftentimes we'd be asked to photograph what they called weather art, which was just whatever images we saw on the street. It was coming up to Mother's Day and I made a beautiful photograph of um, I entitled uh, Muslim with Woman and Child, either from Passaic, New Jersey or Patterson, New Jersey, I'm not 100% sure. But instead of using that for Mother's Day, they the paper ran a photograph of a, a duck and her ducklings. And I I was so really hurt by that, to be to be quite honest, it was, um, it was just a a moment i said oh i you know to me it was like the perfect photograph you know to show mother's day a, you know a woman and her child and it was just totally it was used another time but it wasn't used it was totally out of context by the time it was used mm -hmm. um you know the other thing and I, and i just kind of said like you know how do we change those images and this was about 30 years ago 20 30 years ago so i have seen changes and i'm really so happy to um, be a part of an organization, Kamoinge, someone um, mispronounced it, but um, that really helps get our message out there. And, you know, we've been um, an organization since about 1963, which is a very long time ago, and you still have major corporations and major museums that don't know of our work. It's coming, it's slowly coming. We were just at uh, Virginia Museum of Fine Arts and that traveled to the Whitney and it's now at the Getty. So um, having been a photographer in the field for quite a number of years, I'm really happy to see the changes that are making. And I hope that um, we can just stay strong and continue with shows of this nature. Thank you. Thank you, Colette. Um, awesome. Um, we have, well, I would love to ask a question to for the curator and the participants. Um, I was wondering just to hear more about the process about um, participating in or curating such a multi-generational show. Um, were there challenges there? How did you work through them? What kinds of like amazing, fruitful, you know, relations or products came from those, um, that process? Um, you know, I think the, uh, a major challenge was time. So we pulled the show together really fast. Um, and um, scale, it, you know, if you go, it's a big show. And so, um, the team at Express New York and at the Paul Robeson, Paul Robeson Gallery, excuse me, were um, really incredible. But, you know, time, I don't think there would ever be enough time, um, 
because you know you're always looking and you go back and you think oh well maybe I should have put this here or maybe this belongs in a different section um but you know as I said earlier every photographer we wanted said yes and it, it was an it was an incredible but such a positive challenge to be in is thinking about okay we have all the work that we wanted and more so how do we begin to kind of make conversation and that decision of putting the work by young people next to adults was a big risk and we weren't sure that it was going to pay off that it was going to be well received because the traditional thing to do would have been one section girls one section adults the next floor one section girls one section adults and you know you could have easily done a show it would have been beautiful like that um, but how do you kind of really have the two in conversation and how do you kind of get rid of that hierarchy? And those were two things that we, it was, it was um, a challenge to, to like really make sure we did that with intention through all three floors and take those risks. And I'm, I'm just really glad we did. I feel like for the, uh, especially the younger artists uh, that, you know, showing with like some of us, like even me, I was chuffed to be with um, Deborah and Carrie Mae and uh, Roberts. What's her first name? Deborah. De oh, Deborah. Okay, Deborah Roberts. Um, I was I was quite chuffed to be in the show show with them too. But I think even for the for the uh, the young artists, you know. I think it kind of gives you this idea that, oh, I can I can do that too, or I can have a long career and I can make work that people, you know, want to come see for generations. So I think there's there's that element too, was just really, I mean, you really, you all did the thing, I have to say. Um, yeah. Thanks, Lola. Um, may, I, may I ask a, a quick question or just, I guess it's kind of a statement. Um, it, it's our childhood is so powerful and you know we don't really understand how powerful it is because it happens so fast and you know every day is a different experience you know our parents our cousins our grandparents add so much to our life that we don't necessarily see until we get older so I've just written a book it's a personal narrative with photographs and it's crazy I, I can't get the thing published it seems but I will um, and I reflect in that narrative I re I reflect on growing up like each chapter is sort of almost a decade and then I add photographs to it but I think that was almost the strongest part of the writing for me was to really reflect and so today and I'm you know trying to get more into it I'm using fabric in my photography and I started that during grad school grad school program many years ago but my mother was a seamstress and my grandmother on both sides of my families you know there were seamstresses um, my grandparents came from Guyana and they brought their sewing machines because that's how they were going to make a living once they gave came to America and that is such a strong part of my background and it it just surfaced in my work one day and I and I totally understand why it really surfaced with my photography. So yeah, I, I love what everyone is doing. It's just so powerful to me and especially just looking at our childhood and um, really realizing and talking about how significant those moments were. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Colette. Um, I'm not sure if Danielle or if anybody else wanted to add on anything about that. I would, I'm not sure if you were on the younger, how, how many more, um, how much younger than you of artists there were in the show, Danielle, but I'd be so curious to hear about it from your perspective as well. So <clears throat> I was so I've been lucky enough to be a part of A Long Walk Home for such a long time that I've seen my art in shows. I've seen my art in the first Black Girl Takeover. So seeing it again, it's always a really good feeling, but I think the best feeling was my little sister coming 
to New Jersey and her seeing herself in the museum. And I'm like, that's it. Like, that's what I'm taking the pictures for. But um, yeah, I took, I took the, the watermelon picture um, when I was 17. And I think that's as far back as it goes. But um, just being one of the younger people um, that has art in the show is always very inspiring. And then even seeing people like Seneca step like tell it who's was I think eight or nine at the time of the video that she had in the video um, in the um, gallery it's just always very inspiring to see that happening especially because I wish that I started younger like if I wasn't in girlfriends I don't think I would be taking pictures right now so it's always and I just want to encourage those younger people to keep going because it just gets better from there Amazing. Thank you so much, Danielle. Um, yes, thank you again to Lola and Jess and Zoraida, and again to you, Danielle, for this absolutely fabulous conversation. I can't wait to go see the show. Um, if anybody wants to have closing remarks, um, please go ahead and jump in, and then we're going to turn to poetry. So if anybody wants to... I just want to, you know, thank Brooklyn Rail again and um, Lola and Danielle. Danielle actually has, she's going to be in a show tomorrow uh, in Chicago. So thank you, you know, thank you for your time, um, Danielle. I know you all have a lot going on at A Long Walk Home and Lola, I mean, um, Lola is just, Lola's on fire and I just am, um, um, and and so I'm so thankful for you and and for the time. Um, I'm actually at Center of Photography in Woodstock today for a class, and I you know thank them for hosting me today. Um, but I just hope everyone will go see the show. It's up until the 15th. Bring your mom, bring your dad, bring your sister, bring your uncle. Um, <laughs> there's a wine bar in the building. Go have a glass of wine after. Spend some time in New Jersey. Um, and thanks to the photographers from the show that are on. I see Deb Jack and. Um, Kiana was on and just thanks to all the friends and, and family and amazing artists supporting this work. Yes. And thank you all for joining me today. It really is a feat of non-hierarchical curating, Zoraida, and um, the the idea of um, putting younger artists right alongside these, um, you know, esteemed pho photographers that um, are so well established is just a, a wonderful idea. And um, and I just want to say thanks. And uh, and I agree. Go see the show. It's up for a couple of more weeks. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. Thank I just you. wanted to add just add one part um, that's special for me is just the idea of like expanding your under uh, expanding the audience's understanding of what a girl is, because that way all of us girls can just grow up being happy and not being like, oh, I gotta wear pink. You know, and that that's still a thing, right? St people still do that, and so, to me personally, you know, I think that that's what I what my, was very important for me was just understanding that girl can mean lots of different things. A girl can look like this. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Zoraida. Thank you, Lola. Um, and now I'm so excited for our closing poetry reading today. And as you know, this is our tradition to end our community events with a poetry reading. And today I'm so excited to welcome our poet laureate of the day and beloved colleague, Raven Alia Sr. to the stage. New York City bred creative director, singer songwriter and multifaceted creative Raven Alia Sr. enjoys writing poems about relationships, love and race relations. Born to a Jamaican father who wrote several 80s songs and authored multiple books of poetry. Let's just say it's in her blood. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Raven, thank you. Hello, Hello everybody. That was such a wonderful conversation and I can't wait to go actually see all of the work and bring all of my little girlfriends to go see. It looks, it looks amazing. Um, I wrote a couple poems. Um, I mostly write about love, but I, I felt like, you know, in celebration of like 
black girls and all i wanted to uh, read a poem about uh black women and black joy um yeah so Bob Sprades, 90s R&B, Soul Food, Beyonce, Kelly Rowland and Freddy vs. Jason, The Color Orange, The Color Yellow, The Nail Salon, Running to the Beauty Supply, Afros, Curly Hair, Lace Fronts, Long Nails, Big Gold, gold Hoops, Love Jones, Brown Sugar, Love and Basketball, Brown Skin, Light, Dark, and Somewhere in the Middle, There is Beauty and Blackness, Being Around You is Like a Hug. I struggle with writing about black joy because I just want to feel it, wrap up in it like a kid in a blanket in their rooms afraid of the dark. I want to savor it so much it's so difficult to pick up a pen. It's like the warmth of the sun touching your skin. I don't want to talk about it or write about it because this feeling is fleeting. I can almost feel it now that I'm depicting it. It feels like peace. I love it. Black women, I love you. Um, and then I wrote another poem. Uh, it's a little, uh, it's not about black joy, it's more about black pain. And I don't really feel like that's the tone of how I want this conversation to end. Um, so instead, I'm gonna just read a quick um, love poem. So I can switch it over real quick. Um, okay. I miss you. I miss the way you kiss my forehead and you look at me as I walk through your front door with this big smile like you recognize this ray of light that I carry in my happiness. I miss how much you comfort me in my despair and be there for me through my struggles. I miss our radio acting when we would play pretend and act out our dreams. I miss our 90s dance parties with tequila. I miss when we would have facials. I miss when you would introduce me to tunes I've never heard of and even when you get frustrated about me dancing but chop not poorly. I miss you showing me the world. I miss you seeing, I miss seeing your face light up when talking about the future of what could be. I miss feeling like I was a part of a team. I miss you, I miss us. And, um, and that's it for today. That's all I got. Thank you so much. Thank you, Raven. That was amazing. Um, and thank you just once again. So unbelievably grateful to have had Zoraida, Jess, Danielle, and Lola here on the NSC today. Um, just, it's, yeah, it's been an amazing conversation. I'm in awe. Um, and I would also like to thank Porsche and Shahrazad from A Long Walk Home for all their help to coordinate today's event. Uh, and all their support and it seems like they just have an incredible program and over the past 22 years the Brooklyn Rail has brought together art music dance film theater literature and social and political meditations in our monthly publications and our events like here in our daily NSE um, so please check the chat to support the Brooklyn Rail support our writers editors and operations and please join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for a conversation with Benny Maris and Ksenia Sabolova on the event of Flash, Benny's exhibit at Heroes Gallery. It's going to be awesome. And we will be concluding with a poetry reading by Peter Bozinski. So you all should be able now to um, turn on your microphones and say hello and goodbye as you leave. Thank you to everyone in the audience for joining us today. Hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Thank everyone. You. Wonderful Thank to have you everyone. here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. This was great. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Very inspirational. Thank you, everyone. Hi, Erin. Great to see you. Thanks for joining. <laughs> no problem. Thank you. Thanks, Don. Thanks, Deborah. Congratulations, you all. Thank you, Jess. <laughs> Hi, Fun. Thank you for Hi. Your Thank you. Bye, Thank everyone. you, guys. Congratulations. And go see the show, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Great poetry, Raven. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Raven. Incredible. Thank you for the reading, Raven, also. Yes. Thanks for mm -hmm. Yes. Congratulations again. Go see the show. Two more weeks. And sending love and courage, you all. Bye, Lola.
Bye. Bye. Bye, you guys. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. Take care. Big love to Brooklyn Rail. Yes. Yeah. And thank Can you. Can someone say here. where the show is in Newark? Yep, the show is at Express Newark, uh, 55 Halsey Street um, in downtown Newark. It's in the same building for like, there's a Whole Foods um, in the building right downtown. So it's pretty easy to get to. Um, so that, so it's, that's like the Broad Street train yep, station? Yep. Okay. Yep, yep. Okay. Um, and you. it's up till the 15th. So go, go, go. Two weeks. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.